On today's episode, I will break down the significant comments that Blackhawks Chief Scout Mike Donahue made in a recent interview, and also get into forward Taylor Radish's season recap. All that and plenty more right here on Locked On Blackhawks. Your Locked On Blackhawks, your daily podcast on the Chicago Blackhawks. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome to the Lockdown Blackhawks podcast, part of the Lockdown Podcast Network, your team every day. Today is Tuesday, May 16th. I'm your host, Jack Bushman. You can find me out on Twitter at Jack Bushman2, or you could also go and check out my Strictly Blackhawks account at Talk and Hockey for all the latest Blackhawks news and updates. And real quick, just a reminder that you could subscribe or follow for free on YouTube and wherever you may be listening to your podcast, make sure to go and do that real quick so that you can get the latest episode as soon as it's available each and every day. I also wanted to let you know that today's episode is sponsored by Game Time. Make sure to go and download the Game Time app right now to get the cheapest tickets to all the sports, music, and theater events near you. All right, good morning, everyone. As always, thank you all for joining me on another episode of Lockdown Blackhawks, your one-stop shop for all things Chicago Blackhawks, and thank you all for making the show your very first listen here to start off your day. To open things up this morning, I wanted to start by getting into Chicago Blackhawks Chief Scout Mike Donahue jumping on the Blackhawks Talk podcast recently with Charlie Rumeliotis and Pat Boyle. Quick shout out to both of those two guys. I'm a huge supporter of not only the Blackhawks Talk podcast, but also all Blackhawks content here in Chicago. That's the magnificent part about covering a team in such a large market. There's room for everybody to eat out here. So a uh, shout out to the guys over on the Blackhawks Talk podcast. Of course, Charlie Rumeliotis is a recurring guest here on Lockdown Blackhawks. So I greatly appreciate everything that they do for this show. And look, if you wanted to go check out this interview uh, with Donahue that dropped yesterday, go and check out the Blackhawks Talk podcast. Lots of great stuff brought up by Donahue and lots of Uh, Great questions asked by the crew over there on that podcast. But there were a couple of things in particular that I wanted to make sure to uh, get out there to all you Blackhawks fans that are currently watching this show. Um, First thing that kind of stood out to me in terms of what Donahue mentioned was how all the picks that Kyle Davidson has accrued since taking over as general manager now puts the Blackhawks in a position to do lots of different things and puts them in a really good spot looking ahead because, well, first off, I do want to say Don, he like Davidson, as we've heard, you know, not only on 670, the score recently, but also after the NHL draft lottery, Don, he added, it's pretty unlikely that the Blackhawks are going to make all 11 selections that they currently have in the 2023 NHL draft, but it does allow for them to do a couple of different things. And, be in a better spot. And one point in particular that Donahue talked about was how it does allow them obviously having more draft picks. I think Donahue even added, you know, he didn't remember what general manager said it, but having a, you know, a better chance at hitting on these draft picks, the only way to do that is by getting more draft picks, right? And that's essentially how Kyle Davidson has gone about things. And he's given the Blackhawks a greater opportunity to hit on a lot of these draft picks because they've acquired so many over the years. And another thing that Don, he mentioned too, to go along with that, we've noticed since Kyle Davidson took over, he's really had a focus on netting picks within the first three rounds. And it, that does make sense because most NHLers, as Donahue mentioned, come from the first three rounds of the NHL draft. So having those types of picks also allows the Blackhawks not only an opportunity and a greater percentage to hit on those draft picks, but they have an opportunity to reach higher ceiling players because they have more picks in those round. Odds are, if you're taking a superstar or you have an impact player on your team, he was probably selected in the first first three rounds of the NHL draft. So kind of just some confirmation and some inside details here behind the mindset that Kyle Davidson has had since he's taken over as GM of the Chicago Blackhawks. We've seen, you know, he's done a phenomenal job at taking advantage of, 
teams needing to shed salary or, you know, obviously just teams trying to add pieces to their roster at the deadline. Kyle Davidson has been willing to take on future draft picks, mostly in the first and second round. And he's done a phenomenal job of kind of uh, racking those up in the past year plus. And also having that many picks, Blackhawks have four picks in the second round, two picks in the third. We do, you know, expect them potentially to try and package and, and go back up into the first round. Um, and we saw something like that last year with Sam Renzel. And the reason the Blackhawks can kind of go and take those chances. And Sam Renzel is a guy who, look, he has the 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 frame and the skill set to get the job done down the road. But he's going to be a project. Only 17 years old at the time the Blackhawks drafted him. He's not even going to be playing his freshman year of college hockey until this upcoming year at Minnesota. The Blackhawks took a chance on Sam Renzel because they found themselves in a good situation. All they had to do to get back into the first round was take on Peter Morazic's contract. That really kind of helped them out in the long run. Someone had a start and goal. They also need Peter Morazic's contract. And it allows them to take a risk on a player like Sam Renzel, who they believe has a high ceiling if he can develop properly throughout the next couple of years. And because the Blackhawks have accrued so many of those same types of picks, they have an opportunity to go about uh, things the same once again in the 2023 NHL draft. So I expect the Blackhawks to take more players like a Sam Renzel, guys with high ceilings. They may be little bits of projects, and it could take them three, four, five years to develop. But because the Blackhawks are in this position, they can afford to be patient. They can afford to take a gamble on players like that. So it was kind of interesting to hear Donahue talk about that aspect in particular, how having a slew of draft picks just allows the Blackhawks to do different things. It allows them potentially to try and trade back up. It gives them a better percentage chance of hitting on their draft picks. They're also selecting a lot within the first three rounds. They can take a gamble on player. There's a lot of different things the Blackhawks can do now because Kyle Davidson has been able to add so many draft picks over the next couple of years. Uh, and Donahue, I also wanted to mention, he really... I think this is very important for the Blackhawks in their future and something that they've been missing for years and years and years. And they did a really good job of adding to that in last year's NHL draft, the first under Davidson's tenure. But Mike Don, he said the focus, the Blackhawks scouts are really honing in on players with good skating ability and elite speed. And Don, he even went as far to say as there have been some players in the 2023 NHL draft, they've already kind of crossed off because they don't believe in their skating ability and look the name of the game in today's nhl is speed 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 i mean look at some of these teams in the final four i'll be talking here in just a moment about the stanley cup playoffs speed is the name of the game in the nhl and it seems to only get faster and faster and faster the pace is at an all-time high right now and if you don't have speed you're probably not going to stand a chance it's going to be hard for you to keep up in the blackhawks have just been so slow as a team for far too long. I mean, they did have a couple of pieces this year. Athens, a CU, good skater. Sam Lafferty, a good skater. Uh, I'm definitely forgetting about someone who, oh, uh, they went and added Austin Wagner, who's supposed to be one of the best skaters in the entire league. But as a whole, especially out of their top six, in years past, it's been really evident that they just didn't have the pace to be dynamic and elite producers at the NHL level. So to hear Donahue and the entire Blackhawks scouting department, for that matter, really focused on adding speed to the prospect pool, I absolutely love to hear that. And I think it's absolutely necessary. That's kind of the trait you really need to be focusing on, particularly with the high end selection. So only makes sense for the Blackhawks to try and go out and add some more speed and good skating ability to their prospect pool. Because with that being the name of the game of today's NHL, you got to have speed in order to have a chance to be contenders. And obviously that's what the Blackhawks are trying uh, to build back towards at this very point in time. Last couple of comments from Don. He's interviewed that I found interesting. Again, if you want to go check out the interview for yourself, Go and find the Blackhawks Talk podcast. It's also free wherever you get your podcasts. Um, but I thought it was really interesting to hear Don. He mentioned how kind of another reason why the Blackhawks were a little more willing to take a gamble on a player like Sam Renzel late in the first round last year, and also why they were really wanting to select Kevin Korchinski with the seventh overall selection is because the Blackhawks scouting department as a whole really feels like this year's 
first and second rounds, at least don't have quite the depth of defensemen as last year's NHL draft did. So they wanted to make sure to go and get a couple of quality defensemen in last year's draft. And it sure sounds like we can expect the Blackhawks to be quite aggressive uh, in the forward market. Once again, this year, I believe outside of Korchinski and Renzel, I don't believe they selected a defenseman in last year's NHL draft. Wouldn't be surprised to see them take maybe one or two this year. If that, um, I think they really do want to be adding to their, uh, forward prospect pool, but Don, he did mention that he's really liked what the Blackhawks have done as a whole on the back end uh, since they've kind of kicked off this rebuild. And he would actually take the Blackhawks defensive prospect core against anyone's in the entire NHL. He feels like they have a really good combination of high end potential guys, Kevin Korchinski, a uh, Sam Renzel, um, um, Ethan Del Mastro is someone who's really risen through the ranks over the last couple of years. Wyatt Kaiser, yada, yada, yada. And they also have a solid amount of depth on the blue line as well. I completely agree. I think that's why they're in such a position to go after forwards in this year's draft. But you got to feel confident about the Blackhawks blue line. Mike Donahue sure is. And I understand they've added a lot of big bodies back there. And they also have some guys with true high-end offensive potential. So really do feel like uh, the Blackhawks are in a really good spot in terms of their entire prospect pool. I personally feel like they have the best prospect pool in the entire NHL, and I'm excited for them to only add to that in the 2023 NHL draft. Real quick, I also wanted to be sure to mention that uh, yesterday, according to an article from Rob Rossi of The Athletic, the Chicago Blackhawks denied the Pittsburgh Penguins' request to interview Associate General Manager Jeff Greenberg, who of course was brought on last offseason to kind of take over and kickstart a new era of analytics in the Chicago Blackhawks organization. And when the news first broke that Greenberg was kind of on the Penguins radar for their potential general manager spot, I talked about how if he did go on to get the job, it would be a very tough loss for the Chicago Blackhawks. Only a year after bringing in Greenberg to kind of had and steer this analytical ship. He has to leave just a year in. It wouldn't have been an ideal situation for the Blackhawks. Um, they obviously really liked what Greenberg had to provide. They gave him an interview for the GM spot and then elected to bring him back as the associate. Kyle Davidson clearly values what he brings to the table. So this would have been a really big loss for the Chicago Blackhawks, but no harm, no foul. Jeff Greenberg is not going anywhere and I never thought this was going to be a really good fit for him to go into his first GM job. It was just more so his relationship with Theo Epstein, who's a kind of a minority stakeholder into in the group that owns the Pittsburgh Penguins. I think that's why it's why it made sense for the connection to first come about, but for Greenberg to only be involved in professional hockey for one year and then to go and take on a full GM job. I mean, that personally to me, would have felt like a very big leap of faith, not only for Greenberg, but for the Pittsburgh Penguins to have that, that much faith in a guy like Greenberg. And I also think the Pens are just in a really tough spot right now, right? Like they're going to have to make some very tough decisions in the next several months. And I know a lot of fans are going to be frustrated about that after the 16 year run that they just went on where they made the Stanley cup playoffs each and every season fans are not going to be happy when they see those tough decisions being made. And I don't know if that's the position Greenberg wanted to find himself in. So like I said, I never thought this was going to be an ideal situation for Jeff Greenberg, but he's not going to be going as the Blackhawks have denied his interview request. And for those out there that may be saying that the Blackhawks just deny the interview request without getting any input from Greenberg. No, no, no. I'm sure that's not the case. I'm sure the Blackhawks front office sat down with Greenberg, talked about their options, talked about how he felt about this position, whether or not he wanted to actually pursue it, yada, 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 all those details. And I'm sure as a collective, um, everyone thought that it would be best for Greenberg to stay there. And I'm sure if he was interested in the opportunity, the Blackhawks would not have held him back from doing so. I I'm guessing the most likely scenario is Greenberg wasn't too enticed about this opportunity and uh, like I said, I'm sure he was conducted with the Blackhawks front office about this matter, but nice to know that Jeff Greenberg and that analytical department isn't going anywhere. I know the Blackhawks have been very happy with his work so far. So probably a, a low key, pretty big point here that Jeff Greenberg is going to be sticking on with the Blackhawks front office moving forward.
All right, coming up in just a moment, Hawks fans, I will get into some updates on the 2023 Stanley Cup playoffs as we head into the conference finals. But first, I need to talk to you all about Athletic Greens and their new AG1 product, which is something that I use every single morning because with just one scoop of AG1, you're absorbing 75 high-quality vitamins, minerals, probiotics, and more to help you start your day. And this special blend of ingredients, folks, truly is incredible. It will support your gut health, your immune system, your nervous system, your energy, your recovery, your focus, and even your aging. And Athletic Greens has over 7,000 five-star reviews and is recommended by both health experts and professional athletes. Plus, it'll cost you only $3 per day, which is just such a cheap and easy way to invest in both your health and your body. And to make it easy, Athletic Greens is going to give you a free one-year supply of immune-supporting vitamin D, along with five free travel packs with your first purchase. All you got to do is go and visit athleticgreens.com slash NHL Network. Again, that's athleticgreens.com slash NHL Network to take ownership over your health and to pick up the ultimate daily nutritional insurance. All right, we're back here on the Lockdown Blackhawks podcast, part of the Lockdown Podcast Network, your team every day. Real quick before I get into segment two, I know I'm having a lot of new listeners here on the show since the Blackhawks won the Connor Bedard sweepstakes. So just want to let all of you listeners out there know of the good stuff I have planned for Lockdown Blackhawks this offseason. Of course, I've already gotten into my season recap segments. I'll be wrapping up today's episode with Taylor Radish's season recap. I also am going to be having WGN's Joe Brand on the podcast here sometime soon for an offseason chat on all things Chicago Blackhawks. And with the Hawks now officially receiving the 19th overall selection in the 2023 NHL draft this week, I'll be starting my NHL draft profiles. I'll also begin my end of the season top 10 prospects list. And then in the coming weeks, I'll also be taking a look at some potential free agent fits for the Chicago Blackhawks this offseason as well. So lots of good stuff planned for Lockdown Blackhawks in the next few weeks. Make sure to go and subscribe to the YouTube channel if you haven't done so already to stay all caught up on that good stuff. All right, segment two, let's get into a quick update on the Stanley Cup playoffs, shall we? As we are now down to just four teams and have officially reached the conference finals. And uh, just like we saw in the first round, tons of drama, tons of action, tons of energy, tons of excitement. In the second round of the Stanley Cup playoffs, I mean, I absolutely love this time of year. I love laying back every night watching incredible high-intensity, high-octane hockey. And the second round certainly didn't disappoint in any way, except for my bracket. My bracket certainly disappointed as out of the final four teams left, I only had one of them in my Uh, Only had one of them picked correctly. My champions have been eliminated. Both teams in my Stanley Cup final matchup have been eliminated. It's all kind of a a nightmare at this point in time. I honestly didn't even feel all that confident in my bracket this year. I really had no idea which way it was going to go. And that's what makes the Stanley Cup playoffs so awesome. And unlike any other professional sports postseason, you really never know how it's going to go in the Stanley Cup playoffs. Seeding means nothing. Home ice apparently means nothing just about who's hot and who's playing the best at the right time of the year. And all four teams in the conference finals have done a really good job of that in the past couple of weeks. So getting into some of the second round matchups that we saw starting out in the West, the Vegas Golden Knights, how about it? Defeating Connor McDavid, Leon Dreisaitl and the Edmonton Oilers, another exit from the Stanley Cup playoffs for McJesus and the Oilers. And you know, the fans, up in Edmonton are going to be very frustrated and they had their opportunities. I mean, they were right there. The series was uh, tied two to two, I believe. Yeah. The series was tied two to two going into game five. And then for the Oilers to just Vegas outskated them, Vegas outworked them outside of Connor McDavid and Leon Dreisaitl. The Oilers just could not do enough. Ryan Nugent Hopkins, I think he had one goal in this postseason. That's not going to cut it after the regular season that he had. I thought Zach Hyman was really good and he was really active, but just not enough from the depth players of the Edmonton Oilers, not enough from their defense, which I've always thought was too thin. Stuart Skinner, absolute liability at the end of that round. 
got a feel for Oilers fans. Jack Campbell has to go in. I believe Skinner got pulled in three of the final four games here of the postseason. And look, that's been the glaring hole with the Edmonton Oilers this entire time. They haven't had a defense. They haven't had a goaltender basically in Connor McDavid's entire time with the franchise. And I, I know people are saying it might be time to break apart Leon Dreisaitl and Connor McDavid. I, I don't feel that way. I just think you have to actually give them talent alongside them, not – and look, they're – it's inexcusable for Ryan Nugent Hopkins to play the way that he did in the postseason. And I also think Kyler Yamamoto needs to be more effective. I thought Evander Kane was really good, but I think you need to give this team a legitimate decor and a legit Stanley Cup caliber goaltender. And until you give them that, I think this is going to be the result for Edmonton. It's one of the frustrating things about hockey, but one of the also most beautiful things. You can have the best player in the world. You can even have arguably the best two players in the world. But that's not going to win you at all. This is a team game, and you need everyone working together, pulling their weight in order to get the job done. And the Oilers just have not had that so far. And I really felt this was their best opportunity to get it done. I had the Oilers winning the Stanley Cup. I had them reaching the conference finals, defeating the Vegas Golden Knights in the series. Keep moving on. I felt it was a really good opportunity for them. Their side of the bracket wasn't all that strong. I guess I looked a little bit too far past the Vegas Golden Knights who have now made this, uh, the conference final for the fourth time in six years as a franchise, which is undoubtedly impressive. And man, I'll tell you what, outside of goaltending, this team absolutely has the complete package despite dealing with some injuries still. They're really fast and they have size up front. They're big and rugged on the back end along with some good puck movers. They really have all the pieces. There's just some questions in that because Laurent Brassois went down. They're starting Aiden Hill in the conference finals. I don't love that. Um, but outside of that, Vegas has been really sharp as a team. And I know a lot of people aren't fans of the Vegas Golden Knights, but this was a team that had a really good regular season. People continue to doubt them. I'm even a little ashamed of myself for looking past them because I've always been a believer in the Vegas Golden Knights. Um, so, yeah, tough to get this one wrong as they defeat the Edmonton Oilers in six games. Feel for the Edmonton Oilers fans up north of the border. The other series in the Western Conference that just wrapped up last night, the Dallas Stars take home Game 7, winning 2-1 to one over the Seattle Kraken in the seventh game. Jake Ottinger, per usual, after a loss, nothing short of magnificent, was so close to pitching a shutout until Oliver Bjorkstrand uh, scored the lone goal for the Kraken with under 20 seconds left. What a fight the Kraken did put up in an incredible season. They should not be disappointed and they should not be hanging their heads. I mean, an incredible second season from the Seattle Kraken. They played with an incredible pace. They worked really hard together. You could tell how tight knit and the chemistry was very evident within that bunch. Don't be surprised if they're the next Vegas Golden Knights because this team has a lot of young talent and I, I fully believe they have the pieces to be back again in the future. Now, maybe they exceeded expectations this year, um, but I, I certainly think they're capable with the way that they play the game, the speed and the tenacity. They are seriously, I thought they were the most relentless team on the four check that I've seen in the Stanley Cup playoffs so far, maybe other than the Florida Panthers. Um, the the Seattle Kraken were just so fun to watch throughout these Stanley Cup playoffs and a tip of the cap for their efforts uh, in their second season as a franchise. I picked the Dallas Stars. I really wanted to pick them going to the Stanley Cup. I ended up going with the Edmonton Oilers. I've liked the Stars all year long because I love Jake Odinger and I believe in their defense. Miro Haskinen, Ryan Suter, Yanni Hockenpah, Asa Lindell. They have a really strong defensive core, a really strong top four, along with some gritty players in their bottom six forward group and the big guns up top. And look, they just got past the Seattle Kraken with Jason Robertson not scoring a goal in that entire series. I think that's really scary for the Dallas Stars because if Jason Robertson can get it going and take this team to another gear, I don't think the Vegas Golden Knights are going to be able to beat them in the conference final. I really have liked the Dallas Stars all year long. And I'm probably going to pick them to keep it moving into the Stanley Cup final. Uh, moving out east, oh baby, the Florida Panthers. Shout out to my man Armando Velez from Lockdown Panthers. I know he's got to be absolutely living on cloud nine at this point with both the Panthers and the Miami Heat in the conference final. Florida keeps it rolling. They steamroll through the Toronto Maple Leafs, beating them in five games. Throwback to the chance from the Maple Leafs fans saying, we want Florida. Turns out, no, you don't, because the Panthers are an absolute wagon. They're feeling themselves right now after over uh, after defeating the 
Boston Bruins. The Bruins blow a 3-1 series late in the opening round. The Panthers had all the momentum for basically the entirety of the series against the Leafs. No Canadian team winning a Stanley Cup once again for the 31st consecutive year. It's going to be really interesting to see what happens in Toronto this offseason after the core four once again fails to get the job done. Sure, they did get over the hurdle and get into the second round, but they got absolutely decimated by the Florida Panthers. And then the other series out east, the Carolina Hurricanes defeated the New Jersey Devils in five. I did not see this coming with the Panthers, excuse me, with the Hurricanes being as banged up as they were. No Tavo Teravainen. Um, did they have Sebastian? No Andre Svechnikov, excuse me. Uh, of course, no Max Patch ready. So completely banged up. I thought the Devils were going to take it to him after uh, defeating the New York Rangers in that first round series. But Carolina really had it going on at home. They never gave the Devils any chance to breathe. They wind up finishing this thing in five games. And they will be getting Tavo Teravine and back, it looks like, for the conference final against the Florida Panthers. So getting into my predictions for the conference final. Um, Starting out West, Dallas and Vegas, you heard me mention, I think I have to go with the Dallas Stars. I really believe in what they have on D, and I think Jake Ottinger, in the biggest moments, he seems to step up. Game sevens, he does a lot of good work. Anytime he loses a game, he seemingly bounces back tremendously. I, I think Dallas is... Uh, Rupe Hintz is playing phenomenal right now. Joe Pavelski, obviously, is one of the best playoff performers of all time. If they can get Jason Robertson going, I think that's going to take them to a different level. I'm predicting the Dallas Stars to get past the Vegas Golden Knights in six games. Then out east, the Florida Panthers and the Carolina Hurricanes. I am not a Carolina Hurricanes fan. I did have them uh, beating the Islanders in the first round in my bracket, had them losing to uh, the New York Rangers in the final, the Rangers who I had going all the way to Stanley Cup final. What an idiot I am. Um, I, I just, I, I don't believe in Carolina. I don't. I think Florida's got the momentum. I think they're riding high. I'm going to go with the Panthers in six games. And what a final that would be, Dallas and Florida. That's my prediction right now as to uh, the Stanley Cup final matchup. All right, coming up in just a minute, Blackhawks fans, I still have to get into forward Taylor Radish's 2022-2023 season recap segment. But first, I need to talk to you all about game time. And I just realized I accidentally left up the Athletic Greens uh, overlay for that entire second segment, which I apologize for, Blackhawks fans. Now pulling up the game time overlay, uh, I need to talk to you all about game time, which is the perfect place for last-minute ticket deals. And buying tickets to your favorite events shouldn't be stressful and game time is the fast and easy way to buy tickets to all the sports music comedy and theater events near you and i personally have used game time for probably close to 10 years now it's always been the app that i use to get all of my tickets so cheap so easy i also love how they send me images of my seats and give me event event cancellation protection so make sure to go and download the game time app right now create an account and use the code lockdown nhl in all caps for 20 dollars off your first purchase again all you have to do is create an account and redeem the code lockdown nhl for 20 dollars off your first purchase of tickets easy free 20 bucks right there last minute ticket deals lowest price guaranteed game time all right, before I wrap up today's show, I have to get into my next Chicago Blackhawks season recap segment. I've already gone over basically half the roster at this point. I should be wrapping up my season recaps probably in the next couple of weeks here. If you want to get all caught up on this segment, make sure to go and check out my YouTube channel while you're there. Make sure to smash that subscribe button and you can easily go through each and every video. I have everything time coded in the description, so you don't need to guess where you need to start the segment. You can just go into the description, jump through each video, and quickly get caught up on my Chicago Blackhawks season recaps. So up next, we have none other than 25-year-old forward Taylor Radish, who, like Boris Kachuk, was acquired from the Tampa Bay Lightning, along with two first-round picks as part of the return for uh, Brandon Hagel, which, funny enough, I kind of just took a second look at, a second look, probably the millionth look that I've looked at that trade here on the Lockdown Blackhawks podcast. I just kind of uh, had a little bit of a refresher on that trade yesterday, as I mentioned, with the Blackhawks officially receiving the 19th overall pick in the 2023 NHL draft from the Bolts. Thank you very much, Tampa. Um, for Radish, though, obviously, he was acquired at last year's deadline. He comes on 
plays 21 games for the Blackhawks and really got kind of his first legit opportunity at the NHL level because with Tampa uh, up to the trade so far in his career, just given all the depth that they had in their forward group, particularly in the top six and the top nine, Radish was mostly getting fourth line minutes and just not really a true opportunity that fit his game. But then getting traded over to Chicago, he was immediately thwarted into a top six spot for the final 21 games of the season, wound up scoring six goals, adding four assists for 10 points and flashing a little bit of his skill set and certainly looking as uh, an intriguing option for the Blackhawks moving forward throughout their rebuilding process. And then for the entirety of this year, kind of similar to Philip Kurashev, who I just broke down, the Blackhawks really took the training wheels off of Taylor Radish and said, go play a top six role for the entirety of the season. You might be playing with different guys. There might be some rotations in terms of line combinations and whatnot, but the Blackhawks basically left Taylor Radish alone in a top six spot for the entire season. And I thought he showed some good things in that opportunity. And we also learned, I don't want to say exactly because he still could develop a little bit more these next couple of years, but being 25 years old, it's kind of funny. It feels like uh, Philip Kershev has more NHL experience than Radish does at this point. And it feels like uh, Kershev would be the older one than Radish, but Taylor's actually, I believe, two years older than Philip Kershev at this point. But funny just how guys are in different development spots at certain ages. But for Radish, being 25 years old, I thought this year by allowing him to play in that top six spot all year, we really got a better picture and a better idea of what he brings to the table. And in my mind, Radish's best assets are his goal scoring ability, both with I think kind of a sneaky good wrister. I don't know if he's ever going to be, you know, a sniper out there or anything, but he does have a capable wrist shot and scores a decent amount of goals from that way. And I also think he packages his, he packages his size and goal scoring ability together really well because he's someone that is willing to go to the dirty areas in front of the net or play the bumper roll on the man advantage. He's also been the screener on the power play before. He's not scared to go to those spots, finding the open areas, going to the difficult zones and scoring dirty goals there. So I think he mixes and matches that really well, having a strong wrister and also knowing where he has to go with his size to score the gritty goals. Um, that big frame of his, I think, is really kind of a hidden gem a little bit because the Blackhawks, this is one thing I've talked about a lot on the show, in their top six, and I don't know if Radish is necessarily going to be a top six player on the future Blackhawks teams. It feels like he might be more of a third liner, but we'll see. Um, but the Blackhawks haven't had a lot of size out of players who lead the charge offensively for them. And Radish was kind of a nice reminder of what you can have when you complement size and skill together. And the Blackhawks, look, Patrick Kane, Dylan Strom, Alex Dabrinkit, all those guys, they didn't really have the size to go along with the skill that they provided. Taylor Radish was one of the first guys that they brought in that actually had that full game. And the way that he plays, the way that he's able to use his body along the boards, I think he's better in those areas than people give him credit for. And he knows how to use his size to his advantage. He's not an overtly physical guy. He's not going to run people over, but he knows that he's a big boy and he can use that to help him along the boards in front of the net, along the walls and all that stuff. And on the four check, I think that's kind of a quiet part of his game as well. I think he's um, someone who is not an elite skater, so he's not going to force a ton of turnovers, but he's someone who um, will force you to think twice about your decisions and make you kind of speed up your process a little bit more than you're comfortable at. Um, and then I think one thing that was clear that we learned about Radish this year is he's probably going to be more of a goal scorer than a playmaker. He's not really someone who's setting up teammates constantly or creating a ton off the rush. I think the goal scoring is always going to be the better offensive attribute of his. And that's why I personally think he might be more of a third line guy. If the Blackhawks can kind of round out this roster in the future, when everything gets um, put together and that competitive window, hopefully opens up once again, I think that's kind of going to hinder his ceiling, but I do like Radish as, you know, a, a 20 goal scorer, maybe 25 goal scorer if things go well. We saw that for the first time in his NHL career this season, getting into some of the numbers here for Radish, uh, 78 games played for the Blackhawks, career high, obviously, only 
have two years of data to work off of, but was did a really good job of staying healthy and being a consistent factor in the lineup until the final four games of the season, which he had to miss. And in those 78 games, Radish wound up hitting the 20 goal plateau for the first time in his NHL career. As I've referenced, the goal scoring ability, I think personally is his best asset, made a jump up from 11 goals in 74 games the year prior. So a nice step in his development. We also saw Radish add 17 assists, which was up from 11 in the 74 games the year prior. So maybe not um, a huge leap in that area. Like I said, that's not going to be the strength of his game necessarily, but a little bit capable out there. 17 assists in 78 games helped him post a career high 37 points up from the 22 that he had the year prior. So like I said, I think the ceiling for Radish is probably a 45 to 50 point guy if I had to guess because he's not going to be racking up assists. But if he can be a 2020, 25-25, 25-20 type of guy for the Blackhawks in the future, I think they'd absolutely love to have that out of Taylor Radish and they would take that every day of the week. Um, some of his other numbers here, 16 penalty minutes on the season, not someone who's in the box very often. And as someone who I personally like as a four checker, I think he does a good job of staying out of the box. We also saw Radish add seven power play goals this season, which you love to see. I think he was tied with Max Domi for the team lead in power play goals, and he got it done in a plethora of different ways, as I mentioned, in front of the net with his wrist shot in the bumper roll. He's very versatile, so I really like that attribute about Radish as well. A little bit of a concerning statistic here. He shot 15.5% this year. I don't know if he's going to be able to replicate that once again. So you have to wonder, will Radish be a constant 20 goal scorer? But I will say he did shoot 10.6% last season. He was in the double digits. So I think if he can find that plateau once again on a team that should give him more offensive help next year in terms of the guys he's playing with, I like his odds to reach 20 once again. I mentioned Radish basically was left in a second line role all season long. He averaged 16 minutes and 34 seconds of ice time, added 82 hits in his 78 games, not an overtly physical guy, but can chip in in that area every now and again. 33 takeaways this season. I'd like to see that number get up a little bit more and continue to grow as he uh, gets older and gains more experience. The, the number that might be the most impressive out of Taylor Radish, and he actually led the Blackhawks in this category this year, was in terms of the analytics, the Corsi 4 percentage. Taylor Radish had a 53.7 Corsi 4 percentage this season. To be on this bad of a Blackhawks team and have anything above 50% is pretty magnificent. For it to be at 53.7%, it tells you how much the Blackhawks were playing offense when Taylor Radish was out there on the ice. Now, some of that may be a benefit of uh, playing with you know better players when they were here in the first half of the season, but he still finished the year on a high note. And I think this goes to show you how Taylor Radish impacts the game in different areas and maybe uh, is better in those areas away from the puck than he gets credit for because he was on the ice for 65 goals for the season to 62 against. And Jake McCabe was a guy who had a positive plus minus before getting dealt by the Blackhawks at the deadline for Taylor Radish to be a plus three in all situations in terms of goals given up and goals for that's unbelievable this season undoubtedly one of the best and most um positive statistics in terms of the analytics for the blackhawks all season long that's undoubtedly impressive 53.7 percent really solid year out of taylor radish the last thing i wanted to bring up before i wrap things up was the kind of streaky nature that we see out of radish as well we saw this out of philip kershev and I think if Radish can find a way to be a little bit more consistent next year, he can take his game to another level and maybe even cement himself as a potential second liner for the Blackhawks in the future. But going kind of by a breakdown of the entire season for Radish, he had six points in the first eight games of the season, but then went on to tally just one point in his next 11 games. Following that little bit of a skid, he went on to tally six points in his next nine games and then had one point in the eight games following that. After that next skid, Radish had 10 points in 12 games, but then went on to have two in his next 15 after that before wrapping up the year with 11 points in his final 15 games before getting hurt. So when things were going right for Taylor Radish, he was consistently producing, but when he got quiet, boy, did he ever. And it's about those nights 
the nights where maybe you don't have your best stuff, finding a way to still make an impact and get on the stat sheet. That's kind of the difference. And I'd like to see Taylor Radish take that next step in his development this season, which will be his third as a full-time NHLer. But all in all, the expectations that I had going into the season, the great analytics for Radish, reaching 20 goals this year, playing in 72 of the 82 games, 78 of the 82 games, excuse me. All things considered, maybe um off on this one, I believe 56% of the voters out there on Twitter voted for a B, which by the way, make sure to go and follow at Talk and Hockey on Twitter so you can vote on all of these season recaps and vote on which grade you think each player deserves. Me personally, for Taylor Radish taking everything into consideration, I'm going to give him an A- minus for his performance this season. All right, Hawks fans, I think that is going to wrap up Tuesday, May 16th episode of Locked On Blackhawks. As always, thank you all again for tuning into the show, and be sure to go and follow Locked On Blackhawks for free right now, wherever you may be listening to your podcast, and go and subscribe to Lockdown Blackhawks on YouTube. And that way you can get the latest episode as soon as it comes out each and every day. Once again, I'm your host, Jack Bushman. You can find me out on Twitter. I am messing up these overlays. <laughs> I'm really messing up the overlays now at Jack Bushman too. I'm going to get on out of here before this nightmare continues until tomorrow's episode. It's going to do it for the Lockdown Blackhawks podcast, part of the Lockdown Podcast Network, your team every day.